Good morning, Oregon. It is Tuesday. Tuesday is primary source day. The one day out of each week where instead of reading you a column like I do every other day, instead I read you some especially interesting piece of Oregon's written history, what the pros call a primary source. It might be an old newspaper article, it might be a short story from the precursor to Sunset Magazine, it it might be some world-famous mediocre poetry from Oregon's very own world-famous mediocre poet of whom we are so proud. Whatever it is, it will be an interesting tidbit that could not, for some reason, be used as the basis for a full-on Offbeat Oregon column. Too short, too anonymous, wrong format, something like that. So, here's what I've got for you today. The Bug House Camp by Stuart H. Holbrook, first published in the American Mercury on March 1931. This is one of legendary Oregon raconteur-slash-pop-historian kinda Stuart Holbrook's very first published works, at least in this neck of the woods. It's a memoir from his time working in the woods up in British Columbia. A word of warning. This memoir, written over 90 years ago in another time and place, uses slurs as well as slang terminology for Chinese people and Indian women that are generally regarded as offensive in modern usage. The Bug House Camp by Stuart H. Holbrook After I got the job, I went down to the employment office on the skid road and told the shark to forward any mail for me in care of the Jesse James Jensen Logging Company at Big Creek. So you got the job at Jessie's, he said. Well, she's a bug house camp proper. I had just come for the first time to British Columbia after a winter in the North New Hampshire woods. I wore a derby hat, not uncommon with loggers when in town in the Northeast, but a hat such as had not been seen on the North Pacific in many a year. I think that at that time, in 1920, it was the only derby hat in all the province. I had noticed people on the street looking at it. It got me the job anyway. I found that out the same day I hired out. As I was riding up the Fraser River toward camp with Jesse James Jensen himself, he remarked about my bowler. I hadn't seen a hard hat like that in ten years till you come into the office. It tickled me. And that's how I got my job at what the shark had said was a bug house camp proper. Jesse James Jensen was a stocky man, hard of face except when he laughed. I afterward learned that he had come to British Columbia from Minnesota, where he had worked in logging camps ever since he was a youngster. He had lost two fingers on his left hand somehow. His eyes were slaty blue. At the time I first met him, he was rated one of the largest and most successful logging operators in the province, and by all odds the hardest boiled and most eccentric. He didn't talk much on the way to camp. After turning off the main highway, we drove many miles over a narrow road up a mountain. On both sides of the road, as far as we could see, there were stumps. Stumps, brush, weeds, thousands of feet of logs lying crisscross in old snags. I had been used to logged-off country all my life, but never on such a scale as this. It was complete desolation. I'm no esthete, but the sight struck me forcibly. I said something about it being a pity. What's a pity? Jesse barked. Why, all these ghosts of a fine forest, I replied, somewhat poetically, I suppose, and waved a hand at the miles of black stumps. Did you say you was a logger or a forestation professor? He demanded, and went on in a softer tone. It is a goddamn pity, but I ain't seen nobody yet what would pay me two hundred thousand for letting her stand. That's what I got out of the logs. We ran through several more miles of stumps and got to camp. It was a large one, even for the Pacific coast. The office and good-sized store made up one building. From there to the great cookhouse stretched four long rows of bunkhouses. I had a shack to myself. So did the camp foreman. There were a few families in camp who had shacks to themselves also. In my years in the eastern woods, I had never even pictured such a layout as this. If it was a bug house camp, it was a new sort to me, and I liked the look of it. It was a good camp, too, only a little queer at times. My duties included handling the white payroll, doing first aid work, and helping with surveying when lines were to be run. There were some 200 whites on the payroll. Below the main camp was the China camp. 
here lived about fifty Chinamen who did the falling and bucking of timber. One of the most important features of the white camp, I soon learned, was the bar in one end of the camp store. It was the only bar I have ever seen in a logging camp. We had a man who opened up fifteen minutes before breakfast in the morning, again at noon, and at night until lights out. On Sundays it was open all day. Theoretically, the camp store was the usual sort of commissary kept by the company to supply the simple, homely needs of loggers. Snuff, tobacco, work clothing, and the like. But much of the storekeeper's time at the Jensen camp was required in the serving of an unlabeled beer product, which appeared on the bills of lading every Monday morning as ten barrels bottled foam. At that time, British Columbia had not yet recovered from the Presbyterian Terror. A little hard liquor could be bought legally on prescription, and more was bootlegged at even higher prices. But that was all. This bottled foam, however, did very well. It was the most powerful beer I have ever sampled. It was no uncommon sight to see stolid Swede loggers guzzle a couple pints of it and then stump out of the camp bar humming Vortland aloud, a thing done by Swede loggers only when under the influence of acute patriotism, alcohol, or both. The vice president of the Jensen Logging Company happened to be president of the brewing concern, which put up the six percent foam, and thus we had good, strong beer on tap at all times instead of the slop sold legally at other camps. At that time, ten years ago, there was a great to-do among the proletariat concerning the curse of interlocking directorates, and I enjoyed jibing the especially class-conscious loggers about it, pointing out that they were blessed with this. Potent bottled foam because of the benevolent interlocking of big business. The man who tended the bar was a fellow of imagination. He rigged up a piece of iron pipe for a foot rail. He cut gaudy pictures of movie women from magazines and pasted them on the wall. Jesse had thoughtfully provided a huge cash register with a bell on it that sounded like a gut hammer gong, beautifully deep and long peeling. There were dice cups too, some punch boards, and a gaudy slot machine. To stand outside in the camp street on a Saturday evening and listen to the joint going full blast was to recall the Bowdoin Square, Boston of pre-war days. Chapter Two. Men became scarce in the summer of 1920. Yet the Jensen camp always had a full crew. Strikes caused by the churlishness of arrogant lumber worker union organizers and the bullheadedness of employers closed many camps in the province and across the line in Washington and Idaho as well, but not in the Jensen outfit. The proletariat were roaring in the fullness of their new power. There had been a police strike in Boston, a general strike in Winnipeg, and the Ole Hanson Revolution in Seattle. British Columbia was full of the one big union, similar in membership and tactics to our own benevolent and protective order of the IWW. Lumber was high. The great sawmills on the coast whined all day and night. Log prices went sky hooting. So wild-eyed fanatics cavorted in the skid roads. Fat and often damnably lazy bounders became traveling delegates for the OBU and sold copies of Joe Hill's Wobbly Songbook. Loggers whose former interest in economics had been confined chiefly to the cost of overhauls and Copenhagen snuff suddenly took to speaking casually of what Mr. Marx said to Mr. Engels: "The Red Dawn was just over the hump." Few of the logging operators would allow a known delegate of the OBU in their camps, much less permit a meeting of the order on camp property. From the one big union headquarters in Winnipeg, the camps were flooded every day with lurid papers and pamphlets calling on the workers to arise and shake off their chains in seven languages. Most of this went into the barrel stoves of the camp offices without the operators asking the comrades anything about it. But at Jesse's camp, we harbored and knew it at least a dozen delegates or active members. Most of the crew were packing red cards. The OBU secretary received his hot stuff direct and in good order from the camp post office, and sold or gave away as many papers as he could. The comrades held meetings in the bunk houses, with the Jensen Logging Company paying for the lights. "Let 'em rare on their hind legs," Jesse said. "It'll do 'em good." During the summer, there was an agitation for a qualified first aid man in every camp. I considered myself. Pretty good at this work, but I had nothing tangible to prove it. So Jesse had me go down to Vancouver for a weekend, where I took a couple of lessons and passed my examinations, and received an astounding certificate done in three colors and signed at St. John's Gate, Clerkenwell, London, E.C., by no less a white-collar man than Devonshire patron himself. Since I had never received a diploma of any sort, this document gave me considerable pride. 
I nailed it in a conspicuous place on the wall of the first aid room and always called a patient's attention to it before performing an operation on him with iodine or Epsom salts. One time, I am sure, this certificate was of great professional aid to me. I was approaching the cookhouse for dinner one noon when there was a great uproar inside. Presently, a big Finn logger came out of the door on the lamb. Right on his tail came the even bigger cook, a meat cleaver in his hand. He let fly with the cleaver, it missed the fin by a yard, and stuck fair into the side of a bunkhouse about twenty feet away, where it split a board from top to bottom. The big fin turned and drew his knife. They grappled, and in the wild scuffle that followed, the knife cut the main artery in the fin's right arm. He started to run up the camp street, squirting blood horribly. I followed, trying to catch him to bind him up, but he thought we were going to kill him. Three of us finally captured him and carted him howling and fighting to the first aid parlor. He continued to fight until one of the gang, a fellow countryman, pointed to my impressive certificate on the wall and said something in Finnish. The face of the wounded man at once became soft and he smiled. He was docile and even respectful while I bandaged the wound. The bartender always tried to be helpful in serious cases like this one. He would come to the door and proffer a free pint of bottled foam to the ill or injured. It'll regulate the bile and ease the kidney so's you'll get well quick, was his stock professional remark. Chapter 3 The China camp just below our own was ever a curious thing to me. I had known that Chinamen used to run laundries in northern New England towns when I was a youngster, and the Nick Carter weeklies I had read had proved that all Chinamen were highbinders who did most of their work with hatchets. But that a Chinese could be and was a logger who used an axe and a saw was a fact hard for me to accept. Yet the Jensen Fallers and Buckers were Chinese. The bullbucker of the China camp, which is to say the boss man, was an old leather-faced fellow who had been on the West Coast since before the anti-Chinese riots early in the century. We had him down on the payroll as Washington Duck, and his was the only name. The others were grouped as so many fallers and so many buckers at so much a day. There was a, quote, cook, $100 a month. My instructions were not to bother to check the Chinaman to see how many were actually at work every day, but to take the time that Duck turned in as correct. At the end of the month, I would send a check for the entire payroll to a Chinese labor agency in Vancouver. I suppose the agency gave some of the money to those that earned it. The China cook was quite a politician. Often he would send me a dish of fancy cooked rice and duck. At Christmas time, he appeared at the office with a large bundle under his arm. You like for Christmas, he said and left. The bundle proved to be a huge cake. On the frosting he had lettered with his finger, I suppose, a large pink heart which enclosed the legend, Welcome. The cake, and its legend, was of far more comfort to my soul than a self-styled lumberjack sky pilot who made several abortive attempts to hold prayer meetings in camp during Christmas week. One evening I lay in my bunk reading when a devilish noise suddenly started at the China camp. I had often heard them making loud noises down there, but this night was louder and more of it. Drums were being beaten, and a wind instrument that sounded like a he-goat seeking a nanny was being played upon. At intervals, there would be a terrific crash of cymbals. Obviously, something big was stirring. The next evening, the noise was resumed and continued most of the night. In the morning, Duck came into the office, another Chinaman trailing behind. This fellow was wearing a filthy bandana handkerchief over one eye. "'You look China boy eye,' said Duck. "'See if fix it!' The China boy's eye was beyond fixing. The eyeball hung far down on his cheek. After much argument, Duck admitted that the accident had taken place two, maybe three days before. A bent-over crosscut had Jill poked, and one of the rakers had lifted out the eye. I complained to Duck because he had not reported the accident sooner. We try China medicine first, but no good, he said. Now we try you, doctor. So I knew what the noise had been about. I sent the poor devil to Vancouver, where he was given a glass eye and a few hundred dollars by the workman's compensation board. The one-eyed boy soon sailed for China. He always lucky man, Duck told me. There was only one row at the China camp that summer, and, of course, no white devil ever knew what it was about. One day the son of a stump rancher who lived near the camp came into the office and told me to come quick, that something dreadful had happened. I followed him down a path that led from the China camp to the creek. Not far from the path was a headless body. Wrapped carefully in a Chinese newspaper about four feet from the body was the head of a Chinaman. We left everything as we found it, and I telephoned the sheriff's office. 
After looking over the field, the sheriff called the provincial police. Investigation of every Chinese in camp brought out the fact that not one of them had ever seen the dead Chinaman, heard of him, or any of his relatives, or knew how he had come to be where he was without his head. In fact, they appeared to be surprised at the corpse's presence near their camp. Nothing, of course, came of the investigation, even though a news item in a Vancouver Daily cleverly pointed out that the affair appeared not to have been a case of suicide. Always on the West Coast, the China boys have been held to be economic enemies of the white man. Probably they are. But yet, I know that in the fall of 1920, the Chinese, in the Jensen camp at least, proved that they knew more than the white loggers did when it came to the scientific application of pure unadulterated Marxism. That fall, prosperity took a sudden dive downward toward normalcy. Employers saw their chance. Help was overrunning the country and there were no jobs. So wages were slashed to the bone. In the Jensen camp, the OBU comrades bellowed. They bellowed in vain, although a few of the most radical of them quit in protest. These went to Vancouver and presently, for want of something better, found themselves in the soup line of the Salvation Army. But not the China boys. When I notified old Duck of a 10% cut in wages, he understood what that meant at once, without any of the usual no-savvy business. All right, he said cheerfully. China boy no care. We catch log all same. They did. They catched the log all right, but their output was uncannily exactly 10% less than it had been before the 10% wage cut. I complained officially about the falling off in the log scale. Timber get awful tough, Duck explained to me carefully. She hard for China boy. Never see so hard timber. Such fellows needed no Karl Marx or Big Bill Haywood. Chapter 4 an ancient Scot named Donaldson was the stump inspector in the district where the Jensen concern was cutting timber. That is, old Donald was employed by the Dominion government to take a look at us every so often and make sure we were stamping each and every log that went down to water with the official DT log brand. Jesse James Jensen held that this idea of stamping all government logs was something much to be desired but most difficult of accomplishment, and it is true that in the great rush for logs at that time a few million feet of them were possibly overlooked and not branded. Anyway, the camp foreman and I had instructions to see that old Donald was so well entertained whenever he came to camp that he would never get to the logging works. Getting old Donald drunk was no work for weak cowardly men. He scorned the powerful bottled foam. We would feed him straight scotch for an hour or so and then hand him a shot of Demerara rum to tamp it down, as he put it. He was the only Scot I ever knew whose burr did not thicken in proportion to the amount of alcohol consumed. Grog worked the other way with him. When he was quite sober, he talked as though his mouth were full of haggis. After about one imperial quart of Johnny Walker had gone down the ways, he spoke something approaching English. Ordinarily, the foreman, who was most able at the business, and I, could hold Donald pretty close to the camp stove by generous application of hard liquor and by listening to his stories, not one of which I ever completely understood. But one day he heaved into camp and caught us short on supplies. All we had was one short quart of Canadian club, a drink considered potent enough by most people, but which old Donald termed a nice sort of wine— we fed him all of the Canadian club, drinking nothing but bottled foam ourselves. But it didn't seem to do much good. In fact, it didn't do any good. Donald insisted on going out to the woods. There, he happened upon six Jensen cars loaded high with government logs on which, unfortunately, there were no brands. Donald made a big noise about the unbranded logs. He threatened to shut us down, which he had the authority to do, and shouted that he would lay the entire matter before the Crown or the Privy Council or something like that. The foreman played what cards he could. He threw his hat on the ground, cursed horribly, and told the chaser, whose job it was to stamp the logs, to go get his goddamn time and roll his blankets and fly to Jesus out of there. I'll learn you dudes to sit on your behind and not brand these logs, the foreman bellowed. Next day, of course, the chaser went back to his job at two bits more a day. Jesse James Jensen managed to fix up our mistake somehow, but he gave the foreman and me a going over about it. If I can't depend on you fellers to entertain a government inspector same as he should be, he said, then by God I'll get a couple of Siwash squaws to run this layout. That's our show for today. Thanks again for listening. This podcast is part of Offbeat Oregon History, a public history resource for the state we love. More information is at our hub page, offbeatoregon.com. 
Offbeat Organ is a division of Pulp Lit Productions, a boutique publishing house about which more can be learned at pulp-lit.com. This podcast is covered under a Creative Commons license. For details, see offbeatorgan.com slash cc. Our theme music is by the Atlas String Band and was written by Carmen Ficara. Listen and download more at atlasstringband.com. Questions, critiques, ideas for a future episode? Email me at fj at offbeatorgan.com. Episodes of Offbeat Organ History are uploaded around 6 a.m. every weekday, so the next one will be on your device and ready to go before you know it. Until then, go out and fill up the rest of your Tuesday with good stuff. Bye now. Bye now.